From the great American Southeast, it's time for North Alabama local history. Uh, I'm Tom Osborne, uh, and a lot of you either had me in class or uh, know me from ILR uh, or, or somewhere else. Um, this, uh, this topic is one which uh, surprised me when I uh, originally uh, said that I would talk about this subject at the Institute for Learning and Retirement. Um, I thought it was a little matter. And as I uh, did more research and, and actually gave the talk at ILR, uh, I kept discovering this is bigger than I had imagined. And uh, it is, it's an example of why um, shallow history is dangerous. You gotta keep digging to find out what all the connections are because you don't even imagine how things can be related that are generations in the past. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm telling you is even if you heard this before at ILR, it would surprise me if you didn't discover that it's more than I said it was then. Because I keep finding that this topic is larger uh, than I had thought. Okay, we're going to start with the fact that it is about land. Now, land <coughs> is something that we take for granted because we live in a country which has been settled, parceled out into uh, property uh, for a long, long time. Uh, this, this is the only world we've ever known is one in which uh, land is already divided up. Imagine what it was like in uh, the immediate aftermath of the American Revolution when in the Treaty of Paris the British ceded to the United States of America all the land west to the Mississippi River. When no white settlers were to be found anywhere west of the Appalachians. There's a huge territory of empty, open land. Robert Frost, when he uh, spoke at John Kennedy's inauguration, recited this poem of his, The Gift Outright. And I just want to begin with this, not partly because Frost is my favorite poet and partly because of the subject and the way he approaches it, which is the way you and I would approach it the taken for grantedness of our always having had this land. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England's, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war to the land, vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. That is a view of Europeans' relationship with the land as if it were uninhabited. That's the world I grew up in watching cowboy movies in black and white where the cowboys with the hats were the good guys, and the Indians only made their appearance circling wagon trains trying to kill people. <coughs> the land was ours before we were the lands. <coughs> Not really. The land was somebody else's. Land speculation 
is what we need to think about. An English traveler, William Priest, came to the uh, early United States in 1796 and went back and said to his English uh, friends, were I to characterize the United States, it should be by the appellation of the land of speculation. Major land speculators include everybody you ever heard of at the end of the colonial period and the beginning of the Republic. The greatest land speculator of them all was George Washington. He made enormous sums of money speculating in Western land. Benjamin Franklin, Albert Gallatin, Patrick Henry, Robert Morris, who funded the American Revolution, went bankrupt with bad investments in Western land. Because the government did not sell public land in small units, and this is crucial to the rest of the story, land companies were formed to buy extensive tracts and cut them up and resell them. And because nothing was stopping the constant flow of immigrants coming from Europe who wanted nothing more than land of their own. They could not find it in the cities of the coast and they moved westward into the open country and settled it. Now, that meant from the point of view of an investor in public lands, you were guaranteed a profit. People were moving into this land and the more people moved into the open public land, the more the value of the land went up. The scale of operation of these land companies that bought large tracts of land was greatest in the western lands in the southern part of the new country, uh, the state of Georgia. Now we've got to reckon with colonial land claims. Uh, this is an important map, which you probably saw last when you were in high school. Uh, they're the, the states along the coast, but from colonial charters, royal charters, and so forth, they all claimed lands, some initially stretching to the next ocean, wherever that was. Even when in the 17th century, they had no idea how uh, br broad North America was. But you take the latitude of the northernmost part of your colony and the southernmost part of your colony, and you s extend it to the Pacific Ocean. Or after the Treaty of Paris, you extend it to the, uh, the bank of the Mississippi River. And that's your, that's your state's land claim. Now, you can look at this and you can see that some of these claims overlap. Virginia claimed not only what's now West Virginia and what's now Kentucky, but all of the land north of that up to the Great Lakes. It conflicted with the claims from uh, the states of Massachusetts and Connecticut. You say, well, wait a minute, Massachusetts and Connecticut they're, they're not connected with this land at all. There's New York in the middle. Well, that's true. New York was not part of the Connecticut and Massachusetts land claims, uh, but the latitudes on the other side of New York were considered by those states to be part of their land. Do you have a, a laser <laughs> pointer at the, the button on the top of the clicker is a laser pointer? Yeah, okay. So here we have all of this is, is the Virginia claim. That's the Massachusetts claim. Uh, this, this is the uh, uh, Connecticut claim. <laughs> this little area right here is what is still called the Western Reserve. That is the Western Reserve of the state of Connecticut. You've heard of Western Reserve University? That's why it's called Western Reserve. And if you look on a map, you, what you're going to see is that a lot of the place names in this little area of what's now Northeastern Ohio 
are the same as towns in Connecticut. Uh, what is now the state of Tennessee was the North Carolina claim. Now look at this. This begins to bring us close to uh, home. South Carolina has a tiny little strip of land. That little strip of land includes us, where we are right now. So I'm going to talk a lot about Georgia and what happened in Georgia. And you should know that while the Georgia land claim included almost all of what is today Alabama and Mississippi. It does not include this place. That little strip along and north of the Tennessee River was part of the South Carolina land claim. Now, if you were the state of South Carolina, one thing would be obvious, and that is that you can't do anything with this land. It's not enough. It's too skinny. But it's right along the Tennessee River, too. And so. They want it back. Georgia wants it back so they can have access to it. <laughs> We're not going to give Georgia back land it never had, right? That was South Carolina land. <laughs> okay. But the biggest single area of claim was the claim of Georgia. Now, <laughs> sessions. The United States government had no income tax. How was it to support itself? Even under the Articles of the Confederation, how is the national government to support itself? It didn't even have the right to tax the states. And the answer is, it had public lands it could sell. So it was very important for the Articles of the Confederation government and later for the government under the Constitution to have the states cede their land claims to the federal government because that was its main source of revenue to do everything that it had to do. You couldn't have an army without land sales by the federal government. The claims to the Western lands by the Treaty of Paris in 1783 recognized, as I said, uh, American sovereignty over all this land to the Mississippi. The Articles of Confederation government struggled with this problem to get the states to cede the land. Now, some of this land became the new states, right? Tennessee, Kentucky, right? Those, uh, those coastal states had to cede their land, uh, and they did. <laughs> Georgia's western land claim is the largest. And the state of Georgia clung to its state claim and refused to cede it to the federal government. So by 1800, Virginia, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina had all surrendered their Western land claims, except for Connecticut's little Western Reserve. Tennessee and Kentucky had been admitted to the Union as states. And Georgia was sitting on a huge amount of land. That land was inhabited by uh, various Native American groups that were recognized and treated by the national government as sovereign. Part of the Georgia land claim was also part of Spanish Florida. Now, we have to remember Spain still owned Florida. And the Florida that we're talking about includes that strip along the Gulf that is now southern Alabama and Mississippi, all the way to New Orleans. So the Georgia land claims are contested. They're contested by the native tribes, and they're contested by the Spanish in the south. That means that the whole question of Georgia's land and uh, the federal desire for it, uh, uh, all of that becomes extremely complicated legally. So Georgia's land claims here. This is the little South Carolina claim. And these, these parts of the Georgia claim 
that, uh, that are above the Spanish claim, whoops, didn't mean for that to happen, um, that this part is divided and uh, uh, given to or uh, leased to uh, several companies that are formed, land companies, to sell. So over here we have the inhabited state of Georgia. There's virtually no population other than the natives uh, in this whole region. This region comes to be called the Yazoo land. Now, if that's a familiar term to you, you probably use it uh, to refer to this little corner of northwestern Mississippi. The Yazoo uh, River runs into the Mississippi, and this is extremely fertile land out here. <laughs> what, what it tells you that all of this land was referred to in these, this whole controversy as the Yazoo is what it was really about from the point of view of uh, most people in the United States was the Mississippi River. The Mississippi was the avenue to the world. This is how you're going to get your products out to the world. The Spanish controlled the Gulf Coast. You, you would need their permission to move things out of Mobile. The Mississippi River, however, the border was the eastern bank of the Mississippi. The United States did not have the right, without Spanish permission, to sail down or up the Mississippi. And New Orleans, of course, was not in the United States either. OK, so it's a complicated land situation. This, these are the Yazoo lands, a big, big chunk of Alabama and the state of Mississippi. We have to remember that uh, from 1762 to 181, the, the western boundary of the United States was the bank of the Mississippi River. Spain controlled Louisiana as well as the, the coast. And it's only in 1901 that Napoleon forces the Spanish to cede Louisiana back to France. It had been French, but it, uh, uh, originally it had been French, uh, but it had been in sp Spanish since the middle of the 18th century. <laughs> Napoleon conquered Spain, and he just told the Spanish, you're going to give these colonies back to us, right? His plan was to use that land as a base to suppress the revolution in Haiti by the slave population of that French colony. The French colony in Haiti was the greatest producer of sugar in the world. It was hugely profitable to France. And all of a sudden, in the 1790s, the slaves rebelled and threw the French out. And Napoleon wanted it back. He reinstituted slavery, and he sent an, an army uh, to, to Haiti. They were defeated. When he was confronted with that, he realized that there really was no point in keeping this claim to these Western North American lands. He was not going to get Haiti back. And so what he should do is sell it. And there's really only one party interested and that's the United States of America, which buys it. And we think of that as the Louisiana Purchase. And everybody knows we purchased it from France, but it had only been French for two years. Before that, it was part of Spanish territory. No one could say, writes Henry Adams in his history of the United States, no one could say what was the value of Georgia's title, for it depended upon her power to dispossess the Indians. But however good the title might be, the state would have been fortunate to make it a free gift to any authority strong enough to deal with the Creeks and the Cherokees alone. The Creeks and the Cherokees not only inhabited the land, they had tribal structures that were very strong. Georgia's claims clashed then with the federal government's treaty obligations to the Cherokees and to the Creek tribes and with Spanish claims and grants. 
And the Spanish grants are another part of this background. There were many Americans who had bought land in the Spanish area in Florida, and their grants came from the King of Spain. So if the United States decided suddenly that it was not going to recognize Spanish land claims, it would have deprived many of its own citizens of their land. You see, th this is a really complicated story. <coughs> These are where the Indians lived. The Cherokees, the Choctaws uh, inhabited uh, all, all of this land uh, and, and the creeks in the whole of the south. <laughs> okay, the start of this story, uh, which is going to go in a lot of unexpected directions, is in the 1790s. The Georgians uh, need, want, more, want more English and European settlers. And so they offer uh, large amounts of land uh, to prospective settlers. This is amazing, but true. In 1794, the governor of Georgia gave a million acres to one person. Now, what happens when you have the state officials able to do that sort of thing is corruption, right? You give me a little and I'll give you a lot. I'll give you the best land de deal in the world. A few cents an acre. And all you have to do is pay me off with a negligible sum. In 1789, there are three land companies formed to bid for Georgia's western land. The South Carolina Company, the Tennessee Company, and the Virginia Company. The deals fell apart because they ignored the fact that the Cherokee and the Creeks inhabited these lands and they were not interested in giving them up. And they ignored the fact that the federal government had treaties with these Indian nations and claimed, according to this new constitution, that that was federal business and not state business, right? The relations with the Indian tribes were the federal province in the distribution of powers in the Constitution. And they were governed by treaties. So what Georgia was asking was a violation of the treaty obligations of the United States of America. And if you know uh, anything about this, it's probably because you know about Fort Hampton, just a little bit to the east of us, which when I moved here a long time ago, it was explained to me, it was the only fort ever established by the United States to protect the Indians from European settlers, right? And that's what was going on. Speculators form these companies, and there are lots of prominent political figures, including senators and congressmen, Supreme Court justices, who are part of uh, these land companies. January 7, 1795, the speculators pass, pay the, legislatures of, the legislators of Georgia uh, to pass a law. This is known as corruption. Right? Sells the four companies 35 million acres of land for one and a half cents an acre. This was called, even at the time, the greatest real estate deal in history. All but one of the legislators of Georgia who voted for this act had been bribed. What do we do about that? Well, one person who was upset by this was the current United States Senator from Georgia, whose name was James Jackson. No relation to Andrew. James Jackson is so furious, he resigns his seat in Congress and comes back to start a movement to undo what this corrupt legislature has done. And he succeeds. He gets, uh, it, he gets his own people elected. The, all of the legislators who were bought uh, are defeated in the next election. Jackson's movement wins in Georgia. And the next thing that they do 
is they pass what's called the Rescinding Act. A movement of opposition arises and the voters elect a new legislature and the Rescinding Act, which is written by Jackson, passes. The original act is publicly burned. All documents concerning it are destroyed. This is not just a repeal of a piece of legislation. This is a rescinding. It's like, this never happened. You can't even prove by documentary evidence that they ever passed this law. <laughs> and all further sales of Western lands uh, of Georgia are banned. And this is the famous picture uh, from uh, uh, the rescinding of the act and the burning of the document. If you go to the site where that uh, fire was lit, you will uh, find a historic marker uh, which talks about the Yazoo fraud uh, that began there. So phase two begins. The rescinding act fatefully was not publicized for months. What that did was it gave the land companies in the north, where most of the money was, to market these lands to buyers. The New England Mississippi Land Company was especially successful. And so lots of people in Boston and New York and elsewhere in the north bought tracts of land as investments and then months later they find that they have been duped. The key question legally was whether the buyers and sellers knew of this repeal, this rescinding act or not, or whether they were innocent buyers, whether they were parties to a fraud or innocent buyers. Are they perpetrators or victims? The shareholders of the New England Mississippi Land Company were determined to protect the value of their shares. <coughs> That's how this becomes a national question. Because most of the investors who are caught in this trap live in the north in the northern states. So the standoff becomes one which increasingly represents or replicates uh, the political system of the day, uh, uh, the controversy, uh, the opposition between the Jeffersonian Republicans who dominated in, in most of the southern states, including Georgia, uh, and the uh, Federalists in the north. It becomes a dispute between Federalists and Republicans. The Federalist Senator James Gunn is, the, is regarded as the architect of the Yahoo, uh, Yazoo deal. And Alexander Hamilton, their head man, uh, argues that the German, Georgia legislature could not undo the act. Right? But this business of of simply saying that uh, a law that was, that was successfully passed by a state legislature can be undone because we say so, that, that, that doesn't fly legally, right? You can't do that. Jackson, James Jackson, and the other opponents, of course, are Jeffersonian Republicans. So all this becomes nationalized and politicized. We're kind of familiar with the way things get politicized, aren't we? The president is George Washington. He, he doesn't like this situation that's developing. He's trying to make a treaty with Great Britain called the Jay Treaty. And the Jay Treaty passes by one vote in the Senate. The Senate has to ratify treaties. That treaty is ratified by one vote, and that vote is obtained by a promise from a New York senator to vote for the treaty if another senator would vote to upho uphold the Yazoo land sales, right? 
So the treaty is approved by a two-thirds majority, 20 to 10. <coughs> the loss of one vote would have meant that the treaty with Britain would not have been ratified. In 1798, then, the Congress passes a law that there have to be negotiations with the state of Georgia about its western lands. In 1800, a bill calling for an investigation and some kind of compromise settlement is passed by the Federalist Senate in Washington, but it is rejected by the Republican House. Now comes a nasty complication. Amendment 11, the first amendment to the United States Constitution after the Bill of Rights, comes out of a problem in Georgia. And here is the amendment. This is the exact wording. The judicial power of the United States, the federal court system, shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. That meant that companies and individuals who lived outside Georgia could not sue the state of Georgia. And the Georgia legislature passed a law that said that the citizens of Georgia could not sue the state of Georgia. So nobody can sue the state of Georgia about this. In this situation, you have, at a national level, the press dueling pamphlets being circulated. Uh, one by a, a Federalist named Robert Harper, uh, who is a lawyer for the land companies, uh, uh, argues that the, the sale uh, was completely valid and binding, that the state can not simply declare its own actions void. Only the courts can do that. And Republican uh, Abraham Baldwin uh, issues a rival pamphlet, says the original act was corrupt and fraudulent uh, and questions George's claim to the land to begin with. Well, 1802. Uh, things have been messy, so messy for so long that the state of Georgia finally does what the other states did a long time before and cedes its western land to the federal government in the Compact of 1802. By 1803, the Jeffersonian Republicans now control the White House, Jefferson is president, and the Congress. Federalism is in decline. The federal commissioners and the Georgia representatives propose, propose a compromise settlement. That is to satisfy all legitimate claims by these northern companies uh, stemming from the Repeal Act by setting aside five million acres of land for them. And a law is enacted in, in 1803. But the law doesn't exactly do anything. It, suggests a way forward. So <laughs> nobody agrees. <clears throat> this is the man in the, in the next phase who is uh, the key uh, uh, to what happens. John Randolph of Roanoke. He is, by common consent, the greatest orator of the Congress in those days. He's a, uh, a Republican from Virginia. Uh, and uh, settlers are moving into these lands. Uh, they're establishing plantations. And something else has happened that changes the way in which uh, everyone's thinking about all this, which is the invention of the cotton gin. Uh, these lands are perfect for cotton. And uh, that meant that the, uh, the pressure from settlement and the prospective future value of the cotton lands was growing, right? The Yazoo Company shareholders, in other words, had more and more at stake as every month went by. Randolph was the great obstacle. He was an opponent of the Northern financial interests. He supported the rights of the states as opposed to the federal government. 
and he was completely opposed to any compensation for the companies. And so he blocks all this legislation. He is the Tommy Tuberville of the day. Randolph becomes a bitter enemy, even of his Republican friends, Madison and Jefferson, by blocking any action on this issue. Here is something from the New Georgia Encyclopedia. This is a, a contemporary publication uh, today. Georgia politicians used the Yazoo label to bludgeon opponents for almost 20 years following the congressional settlement. A more tragic legacy of the Yazoo fraud grew out of the 1802 session to Congress. As cotton culture spread across Georgia, the national government proved unable to extinguish Creek and Cherokee claims to land quickly enough for white Georgians, who were rapidly laying claims to inland tracts through the land lottery system. Anger over this matter fueled the development of the state's rights philosophy, for which Georgia's leaders became notorious in the 1820s and 30s, as they continually prodded the United States to complete the process of Indian removal. In a sense, the Yazoo land fraud helped lead to the Cherokee Trail of Tears in 1830. Okay. Not only did this the whole controversy lead to the uh, expulsion under Jackson of the Indians from these lands, uh, but it also created that distinctive deep southern states' rights approach to understanding the Constitution that is the necessary uh, uh, ingredient that will lead to civil war. Right? In other words, this controversy becomes a lot bigger after than, than it ever started off to be. Now, if you're going to solve this problem, um, the, the Supreme Court seems to be the only answer. But how can you get there? How can you get the Supreme Court to make a ruling on all of this if no one is allowed to sue who is not a citizen of Georgia and no one is allowed to sue who is a citizen of Georgia? Right? The, f the, the answer is you have to arrange a case. You have to create a case. The Supreme Court does not like to do this, but there are several important exceptions that they've made, and this is one of them. The failure of the land companies to get their compensation through the Congress leads them to turn to the courts. 1804, the, court, the Supreme Court under John Marshall is the last remaining stronghold of the Federalist Party. The effort to use the courts is complicated by the 11th Amendment. So the solution is found in the creation of what is called by lawyers a collusive case. That is, the supposed defendant and the supposed uh, uh, person aggrieved uh, are actually colluding in this case. Robert Fletcher of New Hampshire sues John Peck of Massachusetts for having sold him land that he did not possess, 15,000 acres of Yazoo land. The suit is filed in 1803. Fletcher versus Peck is the name of the suit. It is one of the most consequential decisions of John Marshall's Supreme Court, but it's one which, for some reason is generally omitted from the way we teach constitutional history uh, at the college level. Uh, John Marshall's decision is in favor of Peck's claim. And it's based on an interpretation of the Georgia legislature's repeal or rescinding of this law as a violation of a contract. There is a clause in Article I of the Constitution that does not allow the Congress to impair the obligation of contracts. That's the language. What's not allowed is impairing the obligation of contracts. 
Now this is a reach because this is not Congress. This is the state legislature. The state grant, is that a contract? Is a state grant a contract? It's certainly not a federal government action. Is it a contract at all when the state grants land? The decision is a, a constitutional precedent which, which we have all the way down to the present day, and it's extremely important. It establishes the precedent when it's decided in 1810 that the Supreme Court may find a state law unconstitutional for violating the Constitution. And this phrase uh, then is applied to the states, not just to the Congress. The impairing of contracts by the state is something which the Supreme Court finds is arguable, justiciable, decidable by the federal courts. Everybody learns Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison is where John Marshall and his court find that the Supreme Court is able to find a federal action unconstitutional. But what about a state action? That's not covered by Marbury versus Madison. That's Fletcher versus Peck. And Fletcher versus Peck comes out of this scandal the Yazoo land scandal. And there he is, the man himself. The contract clause. No state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. <laughs> Under the contract clause, the threshold inquiry is whether the state law has, in fact, operated as substantial impairment of a contractual relationship. <clears throat> so this is the interpretation uh, placed upon the contract clause in the Constitution. And the long-term consequences that flow uh, from Fletcher versus Peck uh, uh, in the American legal system, uh, uh, for, uh, they're, 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 they're just breathtaking. I, I found this hard to believe when I first read it. <clears throat> In the 80 years after Fletcher, that would be from 1810 to 1890, 40% right? of all Supreme Court decisions are based on the contract clause. This one little clause in Article I of the Constitution serves as the ground for almost half of the Supreme Court decisions. Where does the precedent lie? It lies in the Yazoo land scandal. <coughs> Property rights are raised by, by this interpretation to the highest priority in the American legal system. Edwin Corwin, major uh, legal scholar, calls this the doctrine of vested rights, which treats any law impairing vested rights, whatever its intention, as void. <clears throat> so judicial review is extended to state laws. Ever since 1810, Fletcher versus Peck has meant that state laws as well as laws made by Congress are subject to judicial review. This is a significant alteration in the balance between states and the federal government in the Constitution. If you're familiar with the controversy over the Bill of Rights, this, it comes from, it's a very parallel one because those amendments, those first 10 amendments begin saying, the Congress shall make no law concerning X, right? What about the states? Can the states have an official religion? Congress shall make no law. There can be no national state religion but can the state of Connecticut have a state religion? And the answer appears to be yes. Unless you're going to say that that language 
Congress shall make no law applies to the states as well. But it doesn't say that. It says Congress. <laughs> and yet, over the years, over the 200 plus years, the Supreme Court has interpreted the Bill of Rights many times to interp in interpreted more and more of the 10 First Amendments to be applied to the states as well as the federal government. This is known as the incorporation of the Bill of Rights. The incorporation, that's the legal word for this, is the application of the language which explicitly says the federal government to the states as well. And that's the country we live in, right? Imagine what would have happened if they'd said, nope, the original interpretation is the language. The language says the Congress shall make no law. The states can make laws that do not allow for the Fifth Amendment rights. They don't allow for the Fourth Amendment rights. They don't allow for the Third Amendment. They don't. <laughs> we live in, a, live in a different country. The question of compensation of the Yazoo investors, strangely enough, was not resolved entirely by this until in 1814. <laughs> this began in the 1790s, for goodness sake. In 1814, Congress passes and the president signs a law compensating the Yazoo investors by setting aside $5 million to pay these mostly New England investors who had been waiting for their money for a long time. And now you know more than most people who teach American history. <laughs> I love this cartoon. I used to have this on my office door. <laughs> this is a, a, a Larson cartoon, if you've ever seen one. They're very distinctive. The guy with the tiny head raising his hand says to the teacher, oh, you can't, the punchline isn't visible. That's terrible. Mr. Osborne, may, may, I, may I be excused? And what you can't see is the next line, which said, my brain is full. <laughs> my brain is full. <clears throat> if your brain is full, I understand. <clears throat> Thank you.